Your audience, your fan club, like Taylor Swift has the Swifties, Beyonce has the Beehive. We got to think of a name for the Collies or mm-hmm. <laughs> the JL Hive, whatever it is, <laughs> because the tweet grew legs. It did numbers and people were just so excited to see our lifestyle and these choices that we've made validated on such a big stage with someone we respect. So yeah. I'm happy to hear that y'all are friends. Welcome to the Rich and Regular Podcast. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten. And today we have a very special guest. We have J.L. Collins, the godfather of Phi, one of my favorite voices of reason, and just a general good person to talk to. So I am super excited about today's conversation. J.L., well, how am, are you? I'm thrilled to be back on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. We're so, so happy to be chatting with you. Uh, we're here to talk about your second book. I, I presume... Uh, you are not a stranger to our audience, uh, but you do have a new book out. But before we jump into the book, and I guess we're kind of talking about that, I want to talk a little bit about the forward because yes. we have our own thoughts about kind of how this came about. Because right. I do remember, well, let me go back in time. I think it was around 2016 or so. And I'm always keen to these pop culture moments that kind of bring the financial independence movement right. and way of thinking into the mainstream. And I think those of us who are part of this movement, we always take a lot of pride in these moments. It's like, oh my gosh, finally the world is paying attention. The first one that I can recall, I'm pretty sure it was 2016, and it was John Oliver. Are you familiar with John Oliver, the comedian? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there was that Last Week Tonight bit that he did on 401ks where he was really just kind of talking about all of the things that most people were not really paying attention to when it comes to the 401ks. But now with this moment, right, the, the one that I'm referring to is with Hasan Minaj and right. him co-hosting The Daily Show and singing praises for a simple path to wealth. Be, be careful when you f- with people's bank accounts. Everybody in the audience. Sure. Do you think I should go to high schools as I do and talk to them about financial literacy and about credit card debt totally. and about stocks and bonds? Is that a good thing to totally. do? Totally. You should give them J.L. Collins' yeah. book, The Simple Path to Wealth. And one of the addendums should be, turn off any program that I'm on. And almost using it as a weapon to slay Mr. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Uh, in, in everything that he kind of stands for with respect to financial media. I'm curious about, like, how this all went about. Because he wrote the foreword, Hassan wrote the foreword right. for Pathfinders. So... How did this all come about? Did you know that, um, I, I doubt you knew that he was going to mention A Simple Path to Wealth in this conversation, but where were you when it happened? <laughs> <laughs> I was probably asleep, I, you know? I So first of all, I, I had no idea that he was going to give The Simple Path to Wealth a, a shout out. I knew who he was because I'd seen him on segments of The Daily Show, and I, and I think I knew he was doing a guest host a week, because I think that's what they're doing uh, uh, ever since Trevor left. But I, I had no idea that he was having Mr. Wonderful as a guest or or that my book would come up. But after it did, my my social media and my email, it all lit up because, you know, all of my, my friends and contacts who saw it were like, did you see this? <laughs> and it really is a pretty remarkable moment. And it was not one that Hassan planned. And by the way, Hassan and I didn't know each other when he did this. So we do wow. now. Uh, yeah, we know each other now because I, of course, reached out. And first of all, I didn't know how to contact him. And because he had just the week before dropped off of Twitter. So <laughs> my first thought was to to tweet at him and, and see if I could provoke a, a response to the conversation offline. But he dropped off and so I reached out to my audience and said, does anybody know how to how to reach him? And uh, somebody said, well, I know who his PR agent used to be uh, a number of years ago. don't know if she still is, but here's her contact information. So I sent her a note and explained who I was and that I just wanted to, to uh, thank him for, for giving the book a shout out. And I didn't hear anything for about a week. And I thought, well, okay, that didn't go anywhere for whatever reason. And then out of the blue, uh, Hassan himself sent me an email and uh, just 
uh, a wonderfully wonderful uh, note about how much he liked my work and and uh, blah 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 and so that as they say was the beginning of a beautiful friendship and uh, back when we were still in Wisconsin a few months ago you know he's doing a concert tour uh, at the moment and mm. he invited us uh, to the tour uh, to the show and uh, so we drove over and then we got to hang out with him a little bit back backstage and that was the first time that uh, he and I and uh, and my wife uh, got to meet him in the real world. So a, a great guy and a, a really sound um, understanding of this financial stuff, which, of course, I wasn't sure of. I mean, I was pleased at the comment on the book, but it was brief. And But getting to know him and having those conversations. And the other thing that impresses me about Hassan is the respect that he has for for his audience. Because when I asked him if he would do the forward to the book, he didn't immediately say yes. Hmm. He said, well, you know, because he did, he also doesn't really know me other than having read my book. He said, well, let's, you know, let's have some conversations. And we did. We spent uh, about two hours on two different occasions uh, uh, on Skype or on Zoom, I forget which. And he basically was grilling me about this stuff and my attitude towards it. And, and I think he, in a, in a very friendly way, make no mistake, but I think he really wanted to make sure of who I am before he put his name on, on the book. And I appreciated yeah. that because of course it also gave me a chance to get to know in a much better fashion who, who he is. And, uh, so anyway, I, I started out impressed and I just became more and more impressed as, as time went on. So yeah, that's the story. That's a great story. I mean, I, I was one of the people who saw it and our, our jaw dropped. We were just like, oh my God, this is huge. It just felt like Imagine very validating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I went to Twitter and tweeted it and like your, your, your audience, your fan club, like Taylor Swift has the Swifties. Beyonce has the beehive. We got to think of a name for the Collies or the JL Hive, whatever it is, because the tweet grew legs. It did numbers and people were just so excited to see, yeah. you know, our lifestyle yeah. and these choices that we've made validated on such a big stage with someone we respect. So yeah. I'm happy to hear that y'all are friends. That's always. And, and, and always by the way, plus. he walks the walk. You I know, he it. is, he is on the path like, like the rest of us, you know, and, yeah. uh, uh, so yeah, it's kind of, kind of interesting. I love that. I want to, um, I want to dive into the book in a little bit more detail. And there were so many things that I really, that we really enjoyed about the book. One of the big things that I thought was really great was that it, it brought to the light, uh, all of these different stories, all of these different approaches. Um, but it wasn't just focused on people in the United States, right? Some of many of the stories that you collected were from people from all around the world. So I'm, I'm trying to think about a few of my favorites. So obviously there was your personal story, which was also really cool to hear about <laughs> you wanting to take the vacation and your boss pretty much saying like, yeah, no, it, that would basically come at the cost of your employment. But there was yeah. the, the Canadian waiter. There was the guy from Texas who was talking about uh, the, the, the stress of the, the role that he was in and why all of those things, all of these different motivations that led him to ultimately pursue and achieve financial independence. But I'm curious about your decision to focus on stories that were also outside of the U S like, I would imagine that was a deliberate decision, but I want to know a little bit more about why you made that decision. So I don't know that we made that, and we being my my editor, Chris, uh, at Harriman House, who deserves, he was a great partner in this project. And I don't know that we actively made that decision. What we did is I put out a, a request to my audience to share if they were so inclined to share their, their personal stories that would then be in the book. And of course, when we first did that, we had no idea whether we'd get a big enough response for a book, but we did. In fact, we got uh, more stories than we could possibly use. So we went through them, not looking for where they came from, but looking for what we thought were the best stories hmm. and maybe for the widest range of, of stories. Uh, because one of the things, ever since The Simple Path to Wealth came out in 2016, I mean, within six months, I was starting to hear from people 
from all different walks of life from all around the world talking about how they took this book that I wrote for my daughter, right? So it's kind of specific and applied the lessons to it regardless of where they were in their own journeys or where they were in, on the planet. And I just loved hearing that. And one of the other things that I loved about it is when I first started writing in this, in this community, the, the pushback from the, from the world was, oh yeah, that, you know, pursuing financial, that's fine, but only for this certain group of people, you know, which were engineers and wealthy and educated and what have you. And that was not my experience. It wasn't my experience with the feedback I was getting. It wasn't my experience at our Chautauquas, which were the the events where we'd we'd go uh, and take small groups of people out to some cool place. The you know the range of folks that came to those things just belied this concept that it's only for a certain elite group. Uh, and that's what I love most about Pathfinders is that you read these stories and you realize that. You know, almost anybody can do this. And anybody who's listening to us, if they read Pathfinders, they will find stories from people that are in at least as a challenging a position as they, probably more so, who are walking the path. So I've said, you know, if you read Pathfinders, you'll never again be able to look in the mirror and honestly say, it can't be done, mm. or even I can't do it. You can still say, I choose not to do it. But Pathfinders illustrates that it can be done in almost any circumstance. I mean, there's a story from a guy in Ukraine who is not only doing it, but has a podcast talking to other Ukrainians who are, you know, and their country's been invaded, they're at war. So, yeah, I think it's, that, that's what I like most about it. And that's, so the stories kind of came together organically. Uh, and they also organized the book themselves. You know, the book is in nine sections, as you know, and and we didn't have those sections predetermined. Hmm. Uh, well, you're reading the stories, you know, this, oh, we say, oh, okay. And then, you know, the the sections kind of kind of form themselves. And of course, there are some stories that could be in more than one section. So we had to decide, you know, does this one go and... Uh, you know, stay the course or lifestyle inflation or, you know, which section do we put it in? But yeah. I love that. I think um, it's interesting because we found that when we ask people to tell their story, they are more interested in living their life or enjoying their self and they're hesitant to tell their story. So not only was I impressed by the diversity of stories, but just the quantity in and of itself yeah. was just like, it's just pages and pages and pages of examples and one of the things that I've noticed as people are pursuing this path is that some people see all of those options as a, a badge of freedom. It gives them choice. Mm -hmm. It gives them all of the empowerment that you just described, like, OK, well, this person has a situation similar to mine. And some people see those stories and the variety of ways that you can achieve financial independence as a contradiction. They still have this very binary belief that there is a right way and a wrong way. And so right. if they read a story about someone who made their wealth in real estate and then meet, read a story about someone who made their wealth in the stock market, they feel conflicted. They feel like now I'm, I have another reason to be stuck because I can't choose between the two. Right. Do you have any advice for people who may find themselves in that contradictory place well, you know, this is going to sound very self-serving, but the first thing that occurs to me is read Pathfinders because you will, you know, you'll see this incredible range of, of people, but also of how they're approaching it and, you know, the tools that, that they are using, which is also interesting to me because, again, I wrote a, this book for my daughter and I'm pretty specific in the advice I give her. But, you know, when you read through Pathfinders, you realize that these people aren't following exactly what I, what I've said in, in the simple path to wealth, you know, they're, they're adapting the principles in in you know, ways that make it uniquely work for them. So I think just being open to the fact that, you know, that's the real world is maybe the first step is, you know, don't, you know, don't get locked into this fixed way of thinking about this stuff without looking at these different stories. And that's, 
Yeah, that's the thing I I I love about the book, and and that we loved about the stories as they rolled in, and some of them are just a couple of paragraphs long, and some of them are a few pages, and and uh, you know it sort of depends on what they say. And when and when we put out the call, we said you know don't don't worry about if you're not a writer. You know, don't worry. I mean, we have editors, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, but, you know, just put your story down on paper. That's what we, that's what we want to hear. And by the way, uh, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is, is a lot of the people who contribute stories have gotten back to us and said, you know, I love the way you edit it my story you know you really you made it better you, you you kept everything i said you didn't change anything along those lines you just you just made me look better and of course that was our that was our goal there had to have been a story that you really really thought was going to make the final cut that just didn't can you think of one that made the cutting room floor that will likely come out in pathfinders 2 well, uh, this won't come out in Pathfinders 2. I'm not sure there'll be a Pathfinders 2, but <laughs> but if there is, this won't come out in it. And it's kind of a, a, a sad story. There was uh, uh, one in particular that I had actually done uh, as a case study on the blog. And there's only, there's only maybe two, possibly three of the hundred plus stories in there that, that are in that profile. But this was one of my all-time favorite stories. So we, we uh, for those stories, we when it wasn't directly sent to us where it, it had been on the blog before, we reached out again and said, hey, you know, we would like to include this story in this book. And this particular woman refused. Hmm. And we were heartbroken and, and, and we tried to, you know, how can we make this work? What are your concerns? You know, is there anything we can do? And um, eventually she she just stopped communicating. And I was heartbroken because in many ways, it's it's my favorite story of all. You know, it was just, it's just an amazing uh, story of, of triumph over hardship and, and a very difficult beginning and, just incredible um and it it would have been so perfect for the book uh in fact the plan was that that was going to be the very last story in the book because we couldn't think of any any way better to to wrap it up and uh so that one wound up on the cutting room floor so to speak but that was wasn't our choice yeah and you know we actually because when you contribute something to the blog, you know, it's where the blog is very clear that we now own that material. So legally we could have gone forward without permission. Mm -hmm. uh, and we thought about that briefly and said, no, that's not who we are. That's not what we want to do. Um, as, but it was tempting because it's such a great story that we wanted to share, but, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of a sad story. And, uh, I don't want to uh, hang on to sadness as a feeling at all, but you're, you're, what you're making me think of is a project that we actually wanted to undertake a few years ago because we realized very quickly that one of the best things that we could do to help more people become interested in this way of life, this way of thinking, is to just show them what it looks like and to tell more stories and not just ours. Obviously, your book, Pathfinders, does that. And you're saying that there was a story which in many ways was your favorite story that did not make the cut. Yeah. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not you um, experienced a, a, any resistance or any other form of resistance, because we certainly did. We realized very quickly that many of the people who were living that life were just perfectly fine living that life. They didn't want to have this story told. And at first, you know, we started thinking like, wow, this could really help a lot of people. But over time, we started to realize that, well, one, they are entitled to their privacy. They don't need to share any intimate details about their lives. But I'm curious as to whether or not you experienced that outside of just that one story, that one scenario. And what do you think that means if you did, in fact, experience a lot of people being unwilling to kind of share their story? Well, we didn't, but not because there aren't people like that. So 
remembering how the book came together, I, I put out a call through my blog and social media asking people f to send in their stories. So by definition, nobody is going to send in a story if they don't want to tell it. And the people you're describing presumably just looked at that and said, well, no, I don't want, I don't want to bother doing that. The only time that we came across that was, as I say, in the past over the years in, in, uh, on the blog, I'd done, I want to say maybe 15 case studies, but these two were people who'd reached out to me, including the, the woman who wouldn't let me use it in, in the book, but they had at back in the day, they'd reached out to me and asked if I'd look at their situation. And that's was the origin of a case study. Uh, and so for those two or three others from those case studies that did make it into the book, when we reached out to them, they were thrilled, you know, like, oh yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I loved having my story told and I, you know, be, uh, be honored to have it in the book. So it was a real anomaly that we had someone who said no, but I'm sure that what you're describing, if you're reaching out uh, you're not asking them to come back to you, but reaching out to them. I'm sure there are a lot of people who don't want to be bothered. who just want to live their life. And, and I, you have to respect that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Now you also wrote a book about your own story that you weren't necessarily proud of, but it's, it's called how I lost money in real estate before it was fashionable, a cautionary tale. Yeah. And I, it was such a funny and refreshing read because it was about pain. It was about, it was about the, the other side of real estate investing. We wrote a blurb for it because it was proof of something that we felt for a really long time, which is that the money that you lose has as much of a story to tell as the money that you make. Hmm. And I'm just curious, like, is there a moment where you learned how to laugh at your mistakes? Was it a time? Was it an age? Was it um, a turning point? Because I think that's a skill that people have to learn. And it takes a little longer when it comes to money because there's so much identity stuff wrapped up in it. Well, first of all, thank you for, for assuming that I'm able to laugh at my mistakes even now. <laughs> well, it was a funny book. <laughs> so the humor yeah. came from somewhere. Yeah. No, I think I came across a quote recently and I I, I can't remember it exactly, but it's, it's something to the effect of, of uh, you know, there's no such thing as failure. There's only learning, right? And so, and, and way back in the day, somebody once asked me, how do you know so much about this financial stuff? And my kind of tongue in cheek answer, but also the cold reality of it is I, I've made every mistake you can possibly make in investing. So if I know anything about it, it's, it's through those mistakes. So I think, yeah, I, I wish that through my life, I'd had the more positive attitude towards failure and mistakes that I have now. I think back in the day, they troubled me more. Certainly, I would not have been able to tell the story of, of that tragic condo with the good humor or, or at all, because it was just too painful closer to it. And now I can look back on it and say, you know, it was, it was, painful. It was expensive. Uh, it was ugly, but I got a good story out of it. And, you know, so I appreciate your bringing up that book. I kind of, it's a short little book and, and, uh, I, I think it is, yeah, I intended it to be humorous at my expense and, uh, Nicolette the illustrator, I think did a wonderful job on the illustrations. So, uh, yeah, but I think now my attitude is, is goes to that quote, you know, failure is, is just its way of learning. And it's, and certainly I, I learned a lot about real estate with that, that first condo purchase. It was a very expensive education, make no mistake, but, but it, but it, but the lesson stuck. <laughs> That's how we think about our real estate stint. We were yeah. landlords for what, five years, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. And it was, it was expensive lesson, but you know, it was, it was a good one. I don't know that we could have gotten it any other way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think that's true. And, uh, yeah, I, I did, I went on to do a little more real estate and more successfully, but well, you know, like you, I probably did it for five or six years before I realized this is a lot like work, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there are easier ways to make money. There are a couple lines in the book, but I want to, I want to call out a particular line in the book. 
<laughs> and, and I'll start by saying I hate when people say that to me because it's like, I, I don't know. I, listen, there are hundreds of, <laughs> hundreds of pages. I don't remember that. I think you may remember this. If you don't, it's not. But the particular yeah. quote is, young or old, if you make achieving financial freedom a major goal, you are looking at about a 10 to 15 year journey. Shorter if you already have some assets, longer if you have debt to unload. I want to talk about that concept a little bit because I feel like there are just two types of people in the world. I feel like there are people that will read that line and say 10 to 15 years. Okay, I can do that. And then there right. are people that say 10 to 15. Oh, my gosh. Like that is that is a ridiculous amount of time. Right. How do we get more people to think about it like I can do that? Like 10 to 15 years feels doable because we talk about the 15 year career in our book and we get a very similar response where some people say, okay, I can batten down the hatches. I can wrap my head around that idea, right. focused, steady work over 15 years. And other people are just far more interested in saying, well, that's just way too long for me. I'm looking for a quicker solution. Why do you think a lot of people struggle with looking at that 10 to 15 year commitment as something that is reasonable? Well, so first of all, that's one of the things I loved about your book. And I wish that I had read your book when I was starting my career and had that frame of reference of, you know, I could make this a 10 or 15 year window. And in a corporate career, in many ways, you kind of have a 10 or 15 year window because before you're about 30, nobody's really taking you too seriously. And by the time you're 45, you know, nobody cares about you anymore. So, uh, you know, I, I wish I'd had that frame of reference because most careers, from my perspective, stretch on far longer than that, you know, and that's a traditional way of doing it. You're looking at, you know, 40, 50 years of, of a career. So when I read 10 or 15 in your book, I'm thinking, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wish I'd known that. But having said that, I do come across the same thing because it's, and not so much with time in my experience, but with the amount of money it takes to be financially independent. So people say, you know, well, that sounds wonderful, but how on earth do I accumulate that massive amount of money? And it is daunting. And it does, I think, prevent some people from taking that first step. Uh, you know, it's the old proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It, but what I tell people is this is not an on off switch. You know, it's not like one day you're not financially independent and someday in the future you are between those two is a journey and every step you take on this journey, you become a little bit stronger. You become a little bit freer. You have a little more in the way of options in front of you. If you're starting out in debt, for instance, you know, every every dollar of that debt you pay down, that's a dollar you're not paying interest on anymore. You're a little bit freer. And then, of course, once you start building your assets, you know, every every step of the way, you're a little fiscally stronger. So sometimes I get the question from people who are older and, you know, they're in their 60s, maybe, and they say, you know, I'm... I'm not going to be financially independent. I mean, realistically until, you know, I may not live that long. It doesn't matter in a sense, because take the steps now and however long you have, you will be that much stronger as time goes on. So I think that's the way I, I like to frame it. And I think that applies whether you're looking at that large sum of money or you're looking at the amount of time it, it takes. So, if you set out and you say, well, I think I need a million dollars and I think it's going to take me 10 years to get there. And, you know, in the, at the end of five years, you only have half a million. Well, it's not a too shabby an outcome. Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, is from Leo Burnett, an old ad agency guy way back in the day. And the quote is, uh, if you reach for a star, you might not get one, but you won't come up with a handful of mud either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're hitting on one of the reasons we stopped focusing, centering the conversation around financial independence, around this, you know, number, this ubiquitous number of 25x your annual expenses, because I think people get so goal focused that they forget about the process and ways to make it enjoyable along the way. 
And we usually use like a, a gas tank metaphor where it's like, okay, if you know you want to take a road trip across the country or to another state and you've only got a half a tank of gas, do you just not go? Or do you assume that somewhere along the way that you'll find some gas stations or other ways to fuel up? And I think encouraging people that once you start this process, your brain changes, there's neuroplasticity, and there's a number of new freedoms that you discover along the way that alter the rest of the journey. And getting them to see that in advance is really, really difficult. But more stories like the ones that you've included in the book help bring that picture to life. That's a, uh, Kirsten, that's a great way to frame it. And and you're absolutely right, because, and I've experienced that in my own life, you know, you, you start any journey, uh, whether it's this financial one or, or a road trip, and you know, and, and we try to make this point in Pathfinders as well, but you, you, all kinds of things are going to happen along the way. And some of them are going to be obstacles you're going to have to overcome, but some of them are going to be wonderful bits of serendipity that you never could have anticipated that were going to, going to boost you along, along your path. And that can be, you know, activities you stumble on or the people you meet and, and, uh, yeah, so it's incredible things happen just when you're on the path, when you start the journey. That kind of leads me to my next question, <laughs> which is a it's a question that I would probably only ask a writer or someone who is in the financial space. But I want to know how you define quality of life, which is one of those metrics that has an individual definition for everyone. And I want to know if you're definition of quality of life has changed over time as you've gotten older. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no softballs <That's>, today. <laughs> yeah, no softballs today. Holy cow. Uh, quality of life. Well, you know, I, I, I think um, when I was young and I, I first started my professional career and started making money, and I wasn't thinking about it quite this way, but I realized that for me, the most important thing was freedom. And that's one of the reasons that I, I kind of randomly, because there was no FI community back in the 70s when I started out. I, I didn't know anybody who thought this way. So I was kind of wandering in the wilderness. And I randomly decided I was going to take 50% of my income and use it to buy my freedom. And of course, you do that by buying assets. And that percentage just random uh looking back on it i think it's I, I think of it now as kind of the sweet spot and then as my income grew you know both the amount of money i was spending on my lifestyle and the amount of money i was buying my freedom with both grew equally so i think that that was my priority is is i didn't care so much and i still don't care all that much about the things the material things that money can buy. But I did very much care about owning my time and, and having my, my freedom. And I, I guess that's what represents quality of life to me. And it never felt like deprivation. Uh, you know, my first professional job paid $10,000 a year. I mean, you know, you have to adjust that for inflation. Remember, this is the 70s, but I was just out of college. Uh, I knew people who were living on $5,000 a year. $5,000 was a whole lot more than I'd been living on in college. So that was a, an immediate <laughs> bit of lifestyle inflation for me. So it just never felt like deprivation. And then as my, my income grew, you know, uh, it, it expanded. So when I was first traveling, I was taking bicycle trips. So, and, and when my twenties, I could do that and that was fun. And it was also the advantage of being cheap. You know, now I'm an old guy. I'm I'm not out taking bicycle tours anymore, but I can afford to travel in a different kind of way. So everything in its season, I suppose. I don't think you're old though. I mean, you just you're older. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to pull a, another story from the book, um, and it was about the lunch that you had with the friend who was earning, mm -hmm. I think you said eight hundred thousand oh, dollars a yeah. year but right. was still living paycheck to paycheck and trying to figure things out. I would imagine they wanted to pick your brain. I don't have friends with, with uh, that earn nearly that much. At least I don't believe that I do. But we certainly yeah. have friends who earn above, like far above average salaries and are 
likely faced with the same situation because it costs so much for them to maintain their lives. Right. Can you tell us a little bit more about that conversation and what happened to that friend? Because I would love to be able to use it as a bit of a precautionary tale to some of the people that we meet and some of the people that we know to let them know what might actually be on the other side of this game that they're playing if they don't quite figure out how to better find a balance between saving, investing, and this cost of living issue that they have. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, he was, a uh, he was in the financial business, which does pay very well. This lunch would have been in sometime in the early nineties, uh, when $800,000 was real money. Oh yeah. Uh, and by the way, that was just his annual bonus. Now, to be clear, uh, in that business, your annual bonus can be a big part of your annual income, but his annual income would have been probably at least a million too. Uh, and he certainly wasn't, he was just a friend. He wasn't seeking my advice or my counsel. Uh, but he was one of those guys who liked to talk about his money. And I think of anything, he, he was sort of bragging about the lifestyle he'd put together and, but he was also complaining about the fact that the $800,000 bonus was not enough to make ends meet. And that sounded ludicrous to me uh, at the time. It probably sounds ludicrous to most of the people, at least I hope it does, listening to us. But when he, he walked through the lifestyle he put together and you start adding it up, you realize that he was factually correct. You know, between the houses and the private schools and the least luxury cars and the, you know, exotic travel and all of this stuff, you realize that he was not making enough money to support the lifestyle he had put together. And the lesson for me in that, in that is that too often I hear people say, oh, only if I made more money, then I could start working on being financially independent. And how much money you make is not a guarantee that you're going to get there. Um, my buddy from that lunch is never going to be financially independent unless he massively reorganizes his life in such a fashion to free up some of that, that big income to buying his freedom, uh, to investing it. The irony, of course, is he's in the investment business. Um, I've known people who've made, you know, I think I have a high school friend who never made more than $40,000 a year. He is financially independent. Uh, I don't like that story because I, you know, I think it's, it's going to lead him to a very difficult place, especially if he ever gets to the point where he can no longer work or loses that job or you know, ages out and still has those expenses. Almost, uh, we're almost at the end here. I, hope, I always enjoy hanging out with you guys. So do we. we Got to make yeah. this more regular. Yes. Oh, I'm <laughs> I'm up for it. I, you know, you don't have to wait until I have another book. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime you'll have me. <laughs> Are you planning to write another book? No, well, no, not at the moment. <laughs> That's what they all say. That's what no. they all say. Everybody I asks us to, about a second book. I have to book. look at my wounds, right? I have to remember it from, uh, You know what it's like to write a book. Yes, <laughs> yes. we do. Yeah, we do. You, you wind up swearing never to do that to yourself again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's truly like having a child. Like, I mean, not yeah. just literally, but it's it's a it is a, a labor of love yes. for sure. But well, I also it's, see a, the, it's a labor anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I also you know, see the benefit. I think, you know, stories and, and books yeah. that encapsulate stories go so much further with people than just straight down the middle financial advice or rules. Yeah. Even the title Pathfinders is far more appealing to me than like rule followers or yeah. <laughs> like something that is <laughs> that doesn't give you any freedom to find a way that is right, right for you. Have you always believed that stories is the best will get through to people or... Is it something that just came as a side effect of you being really good with words? I will, first of all, thank you for the compliment of being really good with words. Uh, you know, I, I think I've always responded to stories. I don't think I really thought about it in, in those terms until fairly recently as I started being a more of a writer myself. But, uh, and I, you know, I like hearing stories. I've always liked telling stories. 
And then almost after the fact, I, I began to realize that it is the way humans learn best. All, all cultures are built around stories. They're built around myths, right? Every culture has its mythology. And, uh, and that's a way of, of that culture educating the, its members as to what's important and how you live and, and what works and what doesn't work and, you know, what you should do and what happens if you do what you shouldn't do and, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah. It's been a hurdle uh, for part of our audience because we understand the power of stories, but there are some stories that have just been passed on for generation after generation. They take up space in your head and the idea right. of rewriting or crafting your own story or giving your story some main character energy where you come in and you save your own right. day, you become the hero of your story, feels very woo-woo. It feels like they're spinning. It feels like they are you know, lying to themselves or pretending that they're not in reality, but we've just learned firsthand the power of telling yourself a more empowering narrative in, in the pursuit of trying to hit these financial goals. Because if you don't, somebody else's narrative takes over and it may not be one that's in your best interest. Well, that, boy, that's absolutely true. And, and it can be the narrative of the, the overarching culture, which probably gets a lot of things right. So there's a temptation to say, oh, it must get everything right. But, you know, I think we all as adults learn that that's not true. You know, no matter how good overarching culture is, there's always room for improvement. There's always things that that it gets wrong. There's always ways that it begins to calcify its story in in ways that are not helpful. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for listening to your culture and the mythology, but also questioning authority, right? And, and uh, including us, you know, people listening to us. I've often wondered, especially when I first started writing, I mean, now I think I have a little bit of a reputation that allows people to be comfortable reading what I write and, and, and seeing some value there. But in the beginning, I used to wonder, why does anybody pay attention to me? I think what I'm writing is as accurate and useful, and it's what I tell my daughter, but I'm just a, a voice among many in the internet. Why does anybody pay attention? And by the way, I would ask people that question, and the, the answers I get back is, well, you know, I don't just, I never accepted you just at face value, but I would take what I was hearing from you and I, you know, I, I look at it in the context of everything that I'd learned in my life and, and the things that I were, I was hearing in other directions and see how well they meshed. And, and that's, I've come to think of is, you know, what I have to say resonates with some people. Does it resonate with everybody? And, and that's okay. Right. I'm going to pull another quote from the book here uh, that really stuck out to me. And um, it's, it's the story of the gentleman who left a million dollar pension behind. And there was a particular line in there where this person was sharing their story. And he said, um, you know, six more years of being half asleep while our kids grew up just wasn't worth it. Not if I finally had enough money to make work optional. As a parent, that really resonated with me. As someone who having a child, that moment, or in certainly the, the year of introducing that child into the world and into our home was a huge uh, game changer in terms of how I viewed my career, in terms of how I viewed the importance of my health and all of these things. But we're talking about someone who left a million dollar pension behind. And I would imagine so many other people would say, that's crazy. You just, you know, you, you suck it up, right? You fight through it, but you don't leave a right. million dollars on the table. Um, but you spend a lot of time and, and you always have talking about family. I've always thought that family was something that we could all generally agree should be the motivating force, the, 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 the core motivation as to why so many people ultimately decide to pursue financial independence. But one of the things that, that I've found uh, is missing in that conversation is the role of fathers. And, and I've tried, I've been chipping away at this for a couple of years, but I believe one of the greatest untold stories of this movement is that there are plenty of fathers who are making the decision to 
put their careers on the back burners and replace that with family. You included this story. This is an example of one father who, in my opinion, made a very bold statement by leaving this pension behind in an effort to put family first. But I'm curious, is this something that you're seeing as well? Like, are you starting to see the shift between more fathers being willing to leave their careers so that they can put family at the center of their lives? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely seeing it. And it's interesting to me because, again, given my age, uh, when I was in the in the midst of my my corporate career, you didn't see that. I mean, that was that was very rare. And if you saw a man do something like that, there are a lot of questions around. I think the world today is is amazingly better than than it's ever been. And I think this is one of the ways is that there is much more freedom and much more creativity uh, and ability uh, for people to craft lives that fit their needs and the needs of their family rather than than some structure. And I'll be honest, that's a little bit jarring to me, you know. So when I read that story, you know, my initial reaction was you're out of your mind. It's six <laughs> lousy years. It's a million dollars. Right. <laughs> what are you thinking, right? But that's a really old school way of looking at it. And and again, I'm I, you know, I'm an old guy and and I have some some roots, some deep roots in, in the in old school ways of thinking about things. That's by the oh, by the way, one of the the most wonderful things about this FI community is that it has kept me in touch with much younger people and it's it's allowed me to to at least vicariously uh, participate in this changing world and appreciate it in a way that maybe uh, would be more difficult for other people in my generation to appreciate without having access to that that kind of thing but yeah to answer your question I, I do see it and while it's a little bit jarring to me, given my background, I, you know, when I sit back and I really reflect on it, I think, wow, what an awesome option for people to have. At the same time, I'm not sure it's an option I would take. But, you know, again, I'm thinking of myself when I was 30. And maybe if I was 30 today, you know, I'd, I'd have I'd have a different point of view on it. But I think the fact that I'm a big believer in having options. I mean, that's that's the core behind being financially independent and being free is it gives you options. And exercising those options, if you have the resources to do it, that should be whatever works for you, you know? You stole my last question. Well, I did. I did. <laughs> um, and, well, I stole it, but I put a different twist on it because it was something that I'd had in my, my, my head as I was preparing some notes. Um, but... Um, well, I had a different question, but JL kind of alluded to it. I was going to yeah. ask you in a world full of doom and gloom and a lot of media led narrative about the state of our economy, the state of the American people and our wallet. I, I, I want to end on a high note. I want to know what you are looking forward to, what you're optimistic about. I love what you just said about the the times that we're in where people have more options to craft a life that is unique to them and their their values versus, you know, one that's prescribed to you and just passed on like paint by numbers. And so I, I wonder if there's yeah. anything else. Is there anything else that you're really excited about or looking forward to for the next decade? Maybe not that long, five years, three years. Wow. That, that's a, that's a great question and a, and a big one. So, uh, yeah, I'm hugely optimistic about the future and I'm a little dismayed by the, the constant, media drumbeat of oh, negativity you know so and I, bad. yeah when when my wife and i watch the news for instance which i try to do as little possible of and you'll see some horrific thing because that's what the news caters to and I, you know i always make the point that you know you're you're seeing that precisely because it's unusual right you don't these horrific things there's a wonderful book called Factfulness that was written by a Swedish guy who's since passed away, but he basically looks at the world in objective measures, you know, poverty, education, 
lifespan, mortality, uh, all of these things that you can really, you know, war and the number of people who die in wars, everything is immensely better than it used to be and has been getting immensely better as time goes on. You know, the the arc does improve. That's that's our history. And I think that, you know, we're we're on the verge of, of well, I think one of two things. I mean, there always there's always these things that could ultimately destroy us, whether it's AI or whatever. So that's always a possibility. But if that happens, then, you know, nothing else matters. But the real possibility is is that things are going to get exponentially better and better and better. Um, you know, you can you can look at 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 how humans have have uh, improved their life from the beginning. So back when we were all hunter gatherers, if somebody figured out a, a better way to make a stone axe, well that knowledge might not ever expand beyond their little group, you know, or maybe the groups nearby because there was just no communication. And then when that person died, that knowledge died with them unless it was carefully passed on to somebody, but it was very, that knowledge was very fragile. And then, you know, you get to the point where humans develop writing and suddenly you can put some stuff down on clay tablets that can be, and then, you know, the printing, you look at each of these things and, mm -hmm. and, and things just expand dramatically once that communication gets better. And then the printing press, things expand dramatically better and the scientific method. And of course, now with the internet that connects all of us and in this, a lot of this stuff is happened in my lifetime. When I started in the seventies on my journey, th nobody used personal computers. There was no internet. There was no way for me to connect with other people who thought the way I did. And even now we're unicorns, right? There, most people don't think the way we think. Yeah. But for the few of us who think this way, we can connect and chat with each other. And we can share our conversation with other people who might be interested. That's incredible. And so with all the challenges that we have, and of course, we still have lots of challenges, our ability to meet those challenges and our, our ability for human minds all around the world to apply themselves to meeting those challenges and to collaborate is the potential of that is just incredible. So I, you know, assuming that, that, <laughs> that, you know, AI doesn't turn into terminators and destroy us. Uh, I think we're on the verge of an, of an incredibly golden age, uh, you know, so yeah, I'm very optimistic about it. Yes. Optimists unite. Yes. I agree. I agree. I, I am not typically uh, jumping on the optimism train, but I, I completely agree with you. Well, I am not, I am not inherently an optimist. I am actually uh, pretty much a pessimist internally. I, my mother was a very pessimistic woman. And so I don't know if that's, if I learned it as a child or if it's hardwired into my genes, but it's a struggle for me. But when you look at the world objectively, as, as the guy who wrote Factfulness does, you know, there's just more evidence for optimism than there is for pessimism. And the other thing is that whether pessimism is more correct uh, than optimism or optimism is more correct, the world's a better place to live in if you're optimistic. The world treats you better and you get better results as an optimist. And I so I learned that well enough to resist my own pessimistic nature and and it's it's paid dividends. That's perfect. I'm going to add that to my quality of life definition, which I'm still working on. So thank you. <laughs> well, listen, if I wish nothing... I thought of that when you asked the quality of life question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can edit it yeah. so that it makes it look we like. <laughs> well, if nothing else, um, we thank you so much for your time. You, um, you're an inspiration to us. You're an inspiration to many. If nothing else, this book um, certainly is going to help a lot of people. You know, if you're looking for an, an excuse or a reason to 
not pursue financial independence, I think you'll find it. But I think if you're looking for uh, a set of stories, a set of um, examples that you might be able to follow or be inspired by, I think you've done a great job of compiling that and ultimately showing people how it can be done and how they can kind of make their own path their own. So thank you for that. Thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to chatting with you at some point again in the future. It's been entirely my pleasure, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime you'll have me. <laughs> Thanks, Jail. If you like videos like this and want to see more, make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications. 